Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll read Hebrews 5, 12 through chapter 6, verse 3. Hebrews 5, verse 12 through chapter 6, verse 3. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So let's just uh, recap, and I'm not going to uh, deal with this in detail. I want to just remind us that the three verses that we dealt with last week, the last three verses of chapter 5, says that you, need to, you should be mature, but you're yet immature. You should be teachers. You need someone to teach you again. Um, instead of having solid food, you need milk. Um, now, he's then in chapter 6, he's going to deal with what those principles are. So what I want to focus on are the three things that he calls these, uh, these teachings. Uh, he calls them milk, he calls them foundation, and he calls them principles. And that's really what we're going to speak about this evening. So if you look at verse 12, for by this time you need, ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles or the message of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. So milk and first principles. In chapter, uh, verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let's go on to perfection. So let's talk about the milk a little bit more. We did speak about the milk last week, and it is the milk that causes the baby to grow. The milk is everything that the baby needs. Baby doesn't need milk plus uh, McDonald's. Um, the baby just needs milk for the first period. But obviously, as the baby grows, he, to, in order to be balanced, the baby needs to move on to solid food and needs to begin to eat vegetables and meat and, uh, and all of those kinds of things. And so he is saying then that these things that we're going to be talking about, and we're going to spend probably six or eight weeks in them, um, these things that he is talking about are the milk of the word. They are the fundamentals. And so they are the things that baby Christians need. Now, you're going to see that there are different angles to what these things are, because they're milk, they're foundation, and they're principles. And so from the milk aspect, they are the first things that a new Christian needs. Now, he's also going to say it's a foundation. And of course, the foundation is the first thing you do. You can't move on unless there is a foundation. The baby cannot begin its life on McDonald's. It's, it's just impossible. He, uh, he cannot chew. He doesn't know how to swallow. He doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, you, you, you will literally kill the poor thing if you uh, try and shove a hamburger down its throat in its first weeks. Um, now, the, the problem is then that unless the baby has the milk, it will not get to a point where it can eat solid food. It will die. And that's one of the problems, is that many Christians come to some kind of faith uh, but they don't receive the milk, and they don't survive. They don't make it. In fact, the, the, the purpose of all of these things, you'll see, and we, it's going to take us a while to get there, but if you get down to verse 4, because he says, because, why must we do these things? Because it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have fallen away. So the danger of falling away. And so if the baby doesn't receive sufficient nutrition in its first weeks and months, 
it will not be able to survive. And many Christians don't survive because they come to make some decision for Christ, whether it's because of an evangelistic service or because of a book or somebody testified to them, and then nothing happens. They, uh, they rejoice in their salvation, if you will, for a, a period, and then it all disappears because there, is no, there has been no milk to bring them to a place where they can now begin to feed themselves. And so it's absolutely vital then that new Christians be taught the first principles or the milk of the word. And you'll see as we go along that these things are the, are the core of the faith. They need to be taught. You see, the problem is that th there's an emphasis in so-called evangelical churches, not what is understood to be evangelical in the political sense today, but in the sense of churches that preach the gospel, there's an emphasis to emphasize the gospel. And so we emphasize the gospel. We say, well, you know, if you, you, you need to pray the sinner's prayer or whatever it is, and then uh, that's where it all stops. But that is not our commission. The commission that Jesus gave is go into all the world, preach the gospel, and teach them or make disciples. So our job, you know, the, the, if... if um, Michelle gave birth to the baby in the next week or two. And she took that baby down to Ralph's, to the supermarket, and put it on the floor and said, there's the dairy section. Now you sort yourself out. There's plenty milk over there. In fact, I'll give you a few bucks so you can pay. Now, obviously that's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's crazy. You say, well, that's a stupid example. No, it's not, because that's exactly what we do. We bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We get, they get them born again, and we say, okay, now go and find yourself a church, and uh, you, you know, you're on your merry way. Sort yourself out. It doesn't work that way. The baby needs to be protected and nurtured and cared for and needs to be fed and needs to be, uh, to be brought to a place where eventually it can go to the supermarket and buy its own its own food. And so it's absolutely vital that new Christians be fed the milk. The milk causes them to grow. Remember we saw in Peter that we desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Without the milk of the word, the baby will not die, either will not grow in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. It may survive. Um, babyhood, but it may be stunted for the rest of its life. It may have physical and even em uh, emotional and mental problems because it was malnourished in its first months. And that's exactly what we find is that there are many Christians who are, who are stunted. There's something wrong with them. Um, and I'm not saying mentally, but spiritually, there's something wrong with them. Because they didn't get the proper food to begin with. And so in the very important beginning stages of their faith, they were not fed. And they grew up wrong. Just put it that way. So the milk is absolutely essential. Now, remember that uh, the writer is saying that we, uh, when we should have been teachers, we need to be taught these things again. So how do I know that I can be off the milk when I'm able to teach these principles? It's as, as, as simple as that. So I don't want to spend more time on the milk because we, we spent time on that last time. So let's get to chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So I'm going to begin with the second one first, with a foundation. And so, just again, just to get the context here, he says, we mustn't lay the foundation again. In other words, as much as the milk is something you have to move on from. Uh, we said last week, you can't drink milk for the rest of your life. You, you have to get to a point where you're able to eat 
a balanced meal that is suited for an adult. The milk is good for a baby, but it's not good for an adult. Uh, obviously, you know, you can have milk with your cookies, but um, you can't survive on milk as an adult. So you have to move on from that. You have to move on from the foundation. So the point that he is making is not saying, well, the foundation doesn't matter, but he says the foundation is a beginning point, and we need to move on from that foundation. Now, the problem here is that many want to move on, but in fact the foundation is suspect. And it's interesting that if you look at verse 3, well, let me pull it up on the screen, this we will do. So he's saying we need to go on. This we will do if God permits. So we will go on from immaturity to maturity. We will go on from the foundation to the structure. We will go on to, from being taught to being a teacher if God permits. So what, does God not want us to grow? Why do we need his permission for us to move on? Well, this is something we've spoken about many times in, dif in a different context. We've spoken before about education. That if the kid doesn't, hasn't assimilated the material at grade three level, he shouldn't be moving on to grade four because he doesn't, he doesn't have a foundation at the, at the grade three level. He needs to be able to understand grade three uh, reading or math or whatever it is, before he moves on to the next level. The problem is we want to just move on. We say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, okay, I've done, you know, I've done this, I've read the six uh, things, the foundation principles, I've got them, I can move on. But God may not have permitted you to move on. Now, this is very simple, because this is exactly what happens in a building today. When you erect a building, the first thing you have to do is lay the foundation. Every building has a foundation. You lay that foundation, and you say, okay, we've, we've, we've poured the foundation, because generally we pour it out of concrete these days. And we say, I've poured the, congregation, the foundation, now I'm going to start building. Can you now start building once you've laid the foundation? No, you can't. There's something that needs to happen, and the key is in, in, verse, in verse 3. It's on the screen. You need a permit. In other words, the building inspector needs to come and look at the foundation and say, the foundation is good, now you can begin to build. Until he has passed the foundation, you can't begin to build. Because if the foundation is wrong, or if it's weak, or something is not, uh, is not right, you can't begin to build because it's going to be a problem later on. So God does not... Uh, God is a great building inspector. God is building. He's in the building business. He's building His church. And Paul uses this picture. He says that we are, we are built up a holy habitation for God as living stones. So God is building his church. And he's building it on a foundation. And the foundation right at the bottom is bedrock, which is Christ. That's the best form of foundation. Um, we, we all know New York City, they have these massive skyscrapers, 100 floors and higher. Um, and the reason they can do that there is because the island, Manhattan, is, is a big rock. And so it doesn't take much to get down to bedrock, and then you can build on that rock, and you can go very high because you have a solid foundation. Here in this area, you can't build high like that because it's all sand. And so the rock is Christ. But now we must build on Christ a foundation of these teachings. And once he is satisfied and he says the foundation is good, now you can move on. You, you see, we, we, we resent the building inspectors because they give us a hard time. But, and sometimes they do just because they have an ego problem. But in principle, 
the reason they give us a hard time is because they're looking out for our good. Because it's no good him saying, or you slipping him a hundred bucks on the side, and the foundation is rotten, and you build the building, and the building falls down. Um, better fix the foundation first, uh, and delay. And I know when we were, we, were, we were rebuilding here, we had to pour foundations on the other side there, and um, we had a problem with the foundation, and we had to dig again and start all over again on one section. Um, and it's frustrating because we want to move ahead. Um, but it's not safe to move ahead. It's not right to move ahead. Um, and so we need God's permission in order to move on. So the foundation is absolutely, absolutely critical. The foundation, the problem with the foundation is, because, is, is that it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't add to the aesthetic or the looks of the building. You, you look around this building, you can't see the foundation. It's buried underground. And in fact, there's uh, substantial foundations under this particular building. There's another foundation that actually runs through right underneath my feet, which connects that column with that column on that side. A massive beam with steel in it that holds the building together. And so we say, well, you know, we, we want to spend money on, on, on finishings and really nice wood and, uh, you know, stained glass. And we want all, we, that's, we don't want to waste money on stuff that's going to go in the ground and that nobody's ever going to see. I mean, no, nobody ever goes to a building and says, wow, what a beautiful foundation. But you mess up on the foundation and you soon know about it. I think we all know about that building up in San Francisco that's busy falling over, leaning over, because the foundation is not good. Now, obviously, that's a different kind of foundation. They piles that they drive into the ground, but it's the same, it's the same principle. And so you, you can see a good foundation. And I can tell you, when we purchased this building, we inspected it. And it was good that the place was run down and broken and wasn't painted. Because we, I could check the foundation. Not by digging down to see the foundation, but by inspecting all of the walls for cracks. And because it hadn't been painted over, if there were cracks, we could see them. But there wasn't a single crack in this building. And, and as you know, this is a, this is a brick and mortar building, not a, not a stick building. But there's not a single crack anywhere. There still isn't a single crack. And this was built in 1964. So I can see the foundation. The foundation is good. It is solid. It has gone through the 74 earthquake. It's gone through, was it 94? 94 earthquake, uh, Northridge. It's gone through all these various earthquakes. And there is not a crack in the walls. We know. The foundation is solid. And the same applies to a Christian. If the sound, that foundation is solid, when the earthquake comes, there are no cracks. But when a Christian begins to crack up, when things go hard, there's a question about the foundation. Are they built on solid rock? Or are they built on sand? You remember Jesus used that illustration. He said, one man, two men built houses. Seems they built in the same area. One man built on the sand, and the floods and the wind came, and the house collapsed. And the other one built on the rock, and uh, obviously a solid foundation, and the winds and the rain came, and the house stood, and it didn't fall over. And so the foundation, even though we don't want to spend time on it, is absolutely important. And it is visible. When I visit churches, I can often tell you whether the foundation is good or not. When I meet with Christians, I can often tell you, certainly after a short while, what kind of foundation does this person have? Because it shows up in the structure. So the, so the foundation is absolutely vital. You can't, at the same time, keep building the foundation. 
You, you, you can't put down the foundation and then you say, well, I'm going to put another foundation, another one, another one. It, it, it doesn't work that way. You need to build a foundation. Once the foundation is good, you start building the superstructure. You begin to, to build the house or the, uh, or the, or the building on, on top of that foundation. Now, the danger with these things is that there are Christians who spend their lives trying to get the foundation right. And they wonder why the house never comes together. I know a group of Christians that we were associated with 25 years ago. 25 years later, when I check on how these guys are doing, they're still preaching these verses almost every week. Repentance from dead works, faith towards God, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, on and on. Year after year after year laying the foundation. And you wonder why nothing ever gets built. So the foundation is vital, but the foundation, we need to move on from the foundation. Therefore, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, and so on. So the first thing is to make sure we have the right foundation. If there is no growth in your life, as we talked last week, then the first thing to check is, how's my foundation? Because if the foundation is bad, the building is not going to happen. One of the problems with the foundation is that you have to get to the rock, which is Christ. Now, you remember in the book of Nehemiah, they rebuilt the temple. And we, sh we looked at a couple of pictures of that in, uh, Matthew ch ch uh, in Luke chapter 21 on Sunday. These massive rocks that were... Uh, formed the basis, the foundation of that, um, of that great building. But after the first temple had been destroyed, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, they go back to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city. And I think it's in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, it says that the workers were exhausted because there was much rubble. In other words, what was happening was, in order to begin to rebuild, the rubbish had to be removed first, in order to get down to a solid foundation. You can't build on the rubble or the rubbish. You can't build on fill. You have to get down to a solid foundation. Now, here's the problem. Many Christians get saved in different situations, and there is no foundation, or there is a terrible foundation. It's bad. And we say, well, that's great. We'll, we'll just start building on that. No, it's, it's going to keep giving problems. And I've seen Christians who spend their lives not getting beyond these basics because they're trying to build on a rotten foundation. When we extended that, the, the area at the, on the other side, which was on the, on the porch on the outside, the, the building inspector forced us to dig up the old foundation. And it was an amazing foundation. I have pictures like pieces of concrete this size. It, it, it was a foundation second to none. The foundation that's there now is weaker than the one that was there before. But they were not satisfied until we had laid a proper foundation according to their specifications. And the principle is right. Uh, the, the practice wasn't so great in this case because it took us weeks to get rid of the old foundation, which was perfectly sound. But generally, we want to build in our lives on suspect stuff. And we wonder why things begin to fall apart at a later stage. So the foundation must be solid. The foundation must be on clean bedrock, must be on Christ. There cannot be old traditions 
old habits, old ideas, old teachings that are not godly teachings that are in the way. And sometimes it takes a long time to get rid of that, of, of that, all of that stuff in order to get down to a solid foundation. And it's interesting, Paul says concerning churches, he says, I will not build on another man's foundation in the book of Romans. I will not build on another man's foundation. In other words, Paul is saying it's very hard to build on a church which has already been established by someone else and the foundation is suspect. Because you spend your lifetime trying to undo the bad workmanship of the past in order to lay a new foundation. Paul says, I'd rather go and start afresh. And so he says, I'm not preaching in the places where the gospel has been preached. I'm going to go to places where the gospel hasn't been preached, where people are uncontaminated by traditions and habits and, and ideas and doctrines that are not godly doctrines. So the foundation is absolutely essential, and we must have that foundation so that we can move on. All right, now, the next thing is the principle. So the milk and the foundation are the same idea, and then there are principles. And here he calls it the elementary principles. In fact, you'll see principles is in italics, so the, uh, the Greek only has the word elementary um, or beginnings. You see in the uh, previous uh, verse, uh, sorry, verse... 12, chapter 5, verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, need someone to teach you again the first principles. The first principles. So what then is a principle? A principle is not the head of a school. It's not P-A-L, it's P-E-L or P-L-E. A principle is a fundamental and every discipline, every area of study or of knowledge or of skill in this world has principles. And there are two principles I'm going to use as an example. The first is, and, and, and a principle really is the, is the lowest level that you can break something down to. Just like the milk is the simplest and yet complete form of nutrition. So the principles is when you boil something down to its very fundamental. What, is, what are the fundamentals of language, of the English language? What is, what is the principle that underlies the English language? A, B, C, D, and that's about as much as I know. 26 letters. Every philosophical book, every book of prose and of poetry, all the books that fill the libraries all over the world are based on only 26 letters. If you don't know those letters, I don't know how they teach kids these days. I, I don't, you know, everything seems to change. But I remember when I first went to school, the first thing on the head, top of the blackboard was A, B, C, D. Except the last letter was Z, not Z. First thing you've got to learn. Now, I, I think they teach kids to, to read without A, B, C anymore. But at some stage, you've got to know the principles. You've know, got to know what an A is. You've got to know how an A sounds. You, you need to know how you can use an A, and eventually you learn what a vowel is and, and how these things fit together. But all of the English language, and, and, and it's a very rich language, and we have a long history, hundreds and hundreds of years of Shakespeare and, 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 and other great writers. But it's all those tw same 26 letters. Not, nothing's different. If you know those 26 letters and you can put them together, you can read and you can write. And so 
that's where it begins. And everything is built on that. Now, obviously, it's going to be crazy. You go, you go to grade one or whatever you go to when you start these days, K or pre-K. It's all so complicated these days. But you, you, you go to your first year and they teach you A, B, C, D. And then the next year you go back, they teach you A, B, C, D. And 12 years later, you're in grade 12, A, B, C, D. No, obviously, you need to learn the principles right at the beginning. And once you know the principles, you now begin to string those letters together in, in, in two, two uh, or three-letter words. Um, you begin to read books that have three-letter words. Uh, 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 then you learn to read books that have four-letter words and five-letter words until eventually you can read books that have complicated words, and even read books that have words you don't understand, but because you know A, B, C, D, you can spell it out, you can figure out more or less how to pronounce it, it's not always that easy, and, and you can often figure out what the word means, even though you don't know the word, if you have the foundation, if you have the basic principles. The same is true of math. The basic principle of math is 1 plus 1 equals 2. And everything runs from that. Multiplication is, an, is just a development of that principle that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Division is a development of that principle. Subtraction is a development of that principle. Algebra works on that principle. The, the math that they use to shoot a rocket up into space and to make contact with the... Uh, with the, what do they call the thing up there where they all live? Hmm? The space station. I mean, it, it blows my mind when you consider the speed at which the Earth is running, is, is rotating, and they send this thing up, and it's flying at thousands and thousands of miles an hour. Even that boggles my mind. And somehow, uh, two days later, they're able to dock perfectly uh, with, within, within an eighth of an inch. Uh, to the space station, and they're able to transfer and all of that kind of thing. But what does that all run on? It all runs on 1 plus 1 equals 2. Basic math that then becomes highly elevated, and uh, you need computers to make the calculation, but it still works on the same basic principle. Computers work on the same principle, except it's not 1 plus 1, it's 1 and a 0. And so all of what you see on your computer, the beautiful graphics that you can see, the videos, the movies, the sound, everything, it's all made up of just two things. Right, Jason? Ones and zeros. That's all. That all comes from those. Now, if you, if, you, if you don't have a zero, or you don't have any zeros, you've got nothing. You don't have any ones, you have nothing. But you put those two things together, and you know how to put them together you have the most amazing technology. Those are the principles. And those principles never change. They never change. One plus one never becomes three. Except if you're a politician. But if you're not, it's always one plus one equals two. Those principles form the basis of that knowledge. And so you can, you can go to anything that you, that you like, any field of, of, of knowledge. And there are basic principles that once you understand them, you can figure the rest out. Or no, not necessarily figure it out, but it's built on, those, on, on that foundation, on those basics. Now, the scriptures are exactly the same. And I know we've spoken about this before uh, some time ago in a different context. But the scriptures are exactly the same. When we don't understand the principles of the Word of God, we end up with all sorts of problems. Now, what are the principles that underlie the Word of God? Let's go to the Old Testament. Remember, the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. What is the, what is the heart of the Old Testament? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. 
Now, you remember, they came to Jesus, and they said to Jesus, what is the greatest of the Ten Commandments? Trying to, to trick him, trying to get him into, into a corner. And what did Jesus say? Love the Lord and love your neighbor. Then he said, on these two hang all of the law and the commandments, not just the Ten Commandments of the law, but the other commandments, 613 rules and laws hang on these two things. Love God, love your neighbor. And this is how it works. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first commandments deal with my relationship with God. You shall not have other gods before me. You shall not have idols. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. If I love him, I will not have other gods. I will not make idols and worship things that are not true gods. I will not use his name in vain. So how many commands are there? Is really only one. If I love him, the other things fall in place automatically. The last six commands deal with my relationship with my neighbor. Shall not steal, shall not have his wife, and so on and so forth. Bearing false witness against him. Same thing applies. What is the principle that underlie those six commandments? Love your neighbor as yourself. If I love my neighbor, I will not steal from him. I will not take his wife. I will not bear false witness against him. I will not kill him. And so on. So do I have to know the Ten Commandments? Re actually not. I just need to know the two. And it's not a matter of knowing them. I need to live them. And if I live those two commandments, I will automatically live the Ten Commandments. And that's why in the New Testament, we're not taught the Ten Commandments. We're taught the one command, love the Lord. And you say, well, I thought you said there were two. Now I'm saying there's only one. Well, in fact, there is only one. Why do I love my neighbor? Because I love the Lord. So even the command to love my neighbor flows from loving God. If I love him, I will seek my neighbor's best interest. So the whole of the Bible comes down to one principle. Loving God. Now, obviously, we know there's a lot more to it than that. We, and, and remember that th these are fundamentals from which we now build. And we, we move on to deeper stuff and bigger stuff and, and higher stuff. But once you get the principle, the rest becomes easy. When you don't get the principle... It becomes incredibly hard. You see, if, if, you don't, if you don't know A, B, C, D, and I'm a little out of my depth here because I know there are different ways of teaching kids to read these days, to recognize words and not letters. But if you don't know the A, B, C, D, you can learn that that word is therefore even though you can't spell it out or whatever, whatever they call it. The next word is leaving because you've learned that shape of word means leaving. But you see, you have to now learn thousands of words in order to be able to read. But if you know the fundamentals of A, B, C, D, you can look and you can say, T H E R E F O, there, therefore. You don't have to know every word because you know the principles. Now, remember what the Jews did. Because they didn't know the principle of loving the Lord, because they, 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 they rejected that or didn't understand that, 
They end up not with 613, but with thousands and thousands and thousands of commands. They end up with a Talmud, which is, which is literally that many, like the Encyclopedia Britannica on, you, on your shelf, of commands. If this happens, then this, you need to do this. If this happens, you have to do that. It goes on and on and on and on. Why? Because they don't have the principles. Now you have to make millions of rules in order to live your life. And folks, it becomes easy if you, if you just remember the principle. People say, well, you know, is it permissible for me to do this? Whatever. Well, ask the question. Does it reflect my love for God? Is it permissible for a Christian to chew gum? Now we'll kill two birds with one stone. If you chew gum and you throw it down on the parking lot or on the pavers outside, like some people do, are you loving your neighbor? No, because some of your neighbors like me like things clean and get upset when you walk and there's just gum everywhere. So should a Christian chew gum? Actually, no. Now, I know this is an extreme example. You know, as long as you stick the gum behind your ear or Dispose of it some other way, that's fine. But you can, you can see, and that's a, obviously a ridiculous example, but every question that you, have to, that you ask, you can boil it down to, how does this affect my relationship with God? Does it reflect that I love Him? Or am I loving this thing more than I love Him? How does it affect my relationship with my husband, with my wife, with my children, with, my, with, with other brothers and sisters? And, and so you say, well, you know, it's quite permissible for me to do something. But it hurts your neighbor. It, it, can you see that it, it becomes pretty easy to figure things out once you know the principles, once you can apply those principles. And so... What he is now saying is that these things that we're going to talk about in these next few weeks become these fundamental principles. And so, yes, it all goes back to loving the Lord, loving your neighbor. But now as a Christian, because you'll see he speaks about the elementary principles of Christ. What is it that, that, uh, that it takes to be a real Christian? What, is the, what are the fundamentals? And the same way as these other principles flow right through. You can never get away from A, B, C, D. You can never get away from 1 plus 1 equals 2. You can never get away from these principles. Once you've laid them, you don't relay them. But once you've laid them, their presence is always visible in what you do. Uh, you, you can't lay a, a square foundation and build a round building. The, it, the, the foundation determines the shape of the building. And so, as we lay that foundation, those principles continue to have an, an effect. Now, I, let me just uh, draw to a close by saying, we, we, you know, what, one of these is, is uh, doctrine of baptisms in verse uh, 2, the doctrine of baptisms. So, we only get baptized once. Do we need to keep being baptized? No, we don't keep being baptized. We're baptized once. But there's a principle behind baptism. What is the principle? The principle is death, burial, and resurrection. And so I'm dead. I'm burying my old life. I'm coming out of the water, symbolic, obviously, of a new life in Christ. But that principle of death, burial, and resurrection is an ongoing principle. You can never get away from that. And even if you've been a Christian a hundred years, you still have to die to yourself. You still have to keep burying your old way of doing things that you might walk in a Christ-pleasing way. And so the principle applies and continues to go through, uh, through, through the rest of your life. So, again, let me challenge you to, to inspect the building. How is the building? 
we challenged you last week to say, well, am I growing? The question now is, is the building sound? Is it solid? Or are there cracks? How is the foundation? Is the foundation good? If it is good, are you building? Or is the foundation just lying there? We've seen around town, from time to time, somebody begins to build a building, they lay a foundation, and they, never have the, they don't have the money to, to finish building, or what, something goes wrong, and the foundation just lies there. Well, it's, it's no good. A foundation on its own has no value whatsoever. When I walk up in the Angeles Forest, uh, there are many, many places where people used to have houses uh, that burnt down in the various fires, but the foundation is still there. Uh, and the, and, the, and the fireplace is still there because it's pulled out of stone or brick. But the foundation is no good. It has no value whatsoever unless there's a building on that foundation. And so even if you look at your life and you say, my foundation is good, the question is, when are you going to start building? You need to start building on that foundation. So, Father, we pray that you would... Help us to examine our own lives, Lord, and as much as we, uh, from time to time, maybe in an informal way, look at our houses and at the buildings around us to make sure that they're not falling down. Lord, help us to do an inspection of our house uh, that we're building in Christ. And Lord, if there are cracks and if there is evidence that the foundation is suspect, help us, Lord, to do the necessary work to shore up that foundation, to fix it, that we might be on a solid foundation. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to also just examine that we're not building on rubble, but that we're building on the rock Christ, that we're not building on traditions and old ideas that are not godly and not biblical. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand. Help us, Lord, to have these things cemented into our lives. Help us, Lord, to understand and grasp these principles, Lord, that they may become the, 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 the things that govern our lives that we don't have to keep learning new things all the time in order to make new decisions. But, Lord, because we are grounded in the principles, uh, the decision-making process becomes easy. And so we pray for your help, we pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that we may grow up uh, individually and corporately as that house of God uh, that you are able to inhabit and that you are pleased with. We ask this in Jesus' name. Go with us, we pray. Keep us and protect us. Bring us together again on Sunday, we pray.